final sermon in the series, One Small Step. We said earlier in this series that either through growth or erosion, change happens subtly. Probably never more, probably hasn't been much of a greater witness of the subtlety of our falling away than the scripture we're looking at this morning in Hebrews chapter 2. There, of course, is a debate raging among theologians on who wrote the letter to the Hebrews. It's unauthored. We do know, even though we may not know exactly who the human author was, we know two things. One is that it was the Holy Spirit who ultimately wrote the book of Hebrews. As we believe all scripture is given by inspiration of God. We also know this, uh, the, this little epistle to the Hebrews is of incredible value to the Christian community. There really, you cannot overestimate the value of this book in being able to bridge the gap between both the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The author of Hebrews is writing to a group of Jewish believers uh, who came to faith in Christ and are experiencing great trials in their faith. They were uh, struggling. They were being persecuted. And as a part of or as a result of this persecution, there, was, there were some that were beginning to waver in their faith. They were still immature. They were not growing and becoming more mature. They were not progressing in spiritual growth. And because of their lack of spiritual growth and their lack of dedication to spiritual maturity, the writer of Hebrews offers several warnings to the believers. Really some, I mean, there are some warnings in this letter to the Hebrews that can cause the hair on your neck to stand up. There are some very serious warnings that he levels against these people. Of course, all done in love and all done for the purpose of admonishing them onto growth and maturity in Christ. He highlights the dangers of not progressing in our faith. And as I told you, this letter is of great value to the Christian community, even though we don't know who the author is, the earthly author, is because he bridges that gap so beautifully between the Old Covenant and the New. You'll see this morning that he actually references some Old Testament stories that his, his readers would have known to encourage them to move on and to move forward. I want you to see that our text this morning, chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, is actually a parenthesis, really, in his thought. It's kind of an aside, okay? He is introducing Jesus Christ in chapter 1 as greater than the angels, which greater is a theme of the book of Hebrews. Jesus is greater. The new covenant is greater than the old covenant. Jesus is greater than Moses. Those are some of the themes that you find throughout this letter. But he busts into the scene in this letter, raising and exalting Jesus in a, in a very amazing way. So chapter 1, he starts by saying, Jesus is the greatest. In fact, I want to read to you the first four verses of chapter 1. I want you to see how the author presents Christ before we get to the warning that he shares with us. Look at the first four verses. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. I love verse 3. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. He comes in saying Jesus Christ is the creator and sustainer of everything. He is the one who has redeemed us. He has paid the price for our sins. He is not just the Lord of creation, the author says. He is the Lord of our soul. 
He is the one who did all of the necessary work to purchase us back to himself. So his work is not just in creation of the world, but in the recreation of his people. He is the exact imprint of the nature of God. Literally, he is God in the flesh. He comes into this letter, writing to these believers, saying, Jesus Christ is greater than everything. And in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, he says this, by way of parentheses, Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders, and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, distributed according to His will. He launches into the warning, having already told us that Jesus is greater. And then he turns to his audience and says, all right, I want to just take a minute and just come to an aside, okay? He says, listen, if he is really this great, if he is really who I just said he is, then shouldn't we pay closer attention to the things that we have heard? What were the things they had heard? The things about Christ. I want you to see the warning, number one. The warning is that we can drift away. What the writer has just disclosed to us, writing to believers, born-again believers, is that we have the ability to drift away from the truth. We can allow that truth to slip away from us. Now, make no mistake about it. He's not talking about us drifting away from our Savior in terms of our salvation. He has already purchased our salvation and has sat down at the right hand of the Father. He has sat down because the work is over. There is no need of ongoing work of redemption. It was done on the cross and proven through the resurrection. So he could sit down because the work was finished. What we are drifting away from, what we are prone to drift away from, is the truth. I'm so grateful that as it relates to my salvation and my standing from God's perspective, I don't have to hold on to that. Aren't you glad about that? That I don't have that, that my covenant with God is not based off of my ability to hold on to it? I am thankful that even when I am faithless, He is faithful. In terms of my salvation, He holds it. In terms of the truth, In terms of my relationship to the Word of God, I have a responsibility not to drift away. Now think about this. We're 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 in southwest Missouri. We've got lakes, rivers, creeks. Many of us have spent a lot of time on rivers and creeks and lakes. We know exactly what that word drift means. We know that with drifting, you don't have to even put in, in any effort in order to drift. In fact, every year, my family and I take a vacation down to Table Rock. We rent a pontoon boat, and we'll tube, and we'll fish, and we'll eat lunch, and eventually we'll pull off in one of the little, little canals, and, and we'll just kind of park it, and we don't really put the, I don't even think it has an anchor, really. But we don't even put an anchor down or anything. We just pull off, the, we're out of the wind and everything, and we'll just kind of hang out. Maybe we'll swim a little bit, but it doesn't take long before we realize that we're up against a tree. I hope the marina that I rent from isn't watching this sermon (laughs) that might violate the deeds of our contract. Oops. Doesn't get hurt. But you've been there. You've been on a canoe. You've been on a boat. You don't even have to, you don't even feel like you're moving. In fact, had you not like been jarred or realized or bumped into something, you wouldn't even maybe even realize if your eyes are closed that you're drifting. It's so subtle. It's so gradual. It takes no effort on your part. In fact, according to the real understanding of what it means to drift, I don't have to put in any effort. All of the effort is being put in by an outside source on me. 
It is pushing me. In fact, in the English, the word drift and driven are the same. They come from the same root word. We're actually being driven by something else. Now think about this in terms of our, our spiritual nature. Spiritually, we, naturally speaking, as people, we are not prone to grab the Word of God. Naturally speaking, we are not ones to run after the Word of God. Naturally, we are ones to go astray. Spiritually speaking, we may have a hunger and a desire for the Word of God, but the natural man does not receive the things of God. They are foolishness to him. If you think about it, our natural tendency is to let go of the Word of God. If we were allowed the natural man to drive the car, he would not drive to the Word of God, but would drive further away from the Word of God. He would not drive to a closer relationship with Christ. The natural man would turn us away from a closer relationship with Christ. Naturally speaking, we want to let go. Naturally speaking, we want to just allow ourselves to drift. But the born-again believer that is drifting will never drift closer to Christ. We'll always drift further away. We don't become a mature Christian by accident, do we? We don't become greater disciples by just waking up and wanting it to happen. We become mature disciples of Christ when we are dedicated and committed, when we are growing intentionally, purposefully towards Jesus Christ. So naturally speaking, every one of us must be careful that we are drifting further from the truth. That's where the natural man wants us to go. What does that look like? What does that mean to drift away from the Word of God? In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus tells a story of a father whose son was going to get married, and the father was going to throw this big wedding banquet. And in chapter 22, the Bible, Jesus tells a story that this man, this son's father, sends out invitations to all these people. And he tells them, I want you to come to this wedding banquet. And people begin to find excuses on why they can't come to the wedding banquet. And the same word in chapter 22, verse 5, is used to describe their relationship to that invitation as the writer of Hebrews uses to describe the, uh, the neglect or the drifting of the believers from the word. And it's this, that they made light of it. They paid no attention to it. What he's saying is when they received that invitation, they just kind of threw it away. It didn't have any value for them. There was no significance to them. There was no benefit they saw. You know, if you think about it, think about it in relationship to our relationship to the Word. When we hear the Word, read the Word, see the Word, are we reading, seeing, and hearing the Word, treating the Word, relating to the Word as it really is the Word of God, the Word of truth, which is able to save our souls, that engrafted Word, Are we responding to it in that manner? Or has it just become a duty, an obligation, something to check off of the box, something that has no real benefit or good for us? Are we making light of it? Are we paying no attention to it? You see, we cannot claim to pay attention to the Word of God if we're not applying it to our life. Paying attention to the Word of God is not just that we have our head up and don't fall asleep during the sermon or Sunday school or our personal quiet time. We can read the Word, but if we're not employing the Word in our life and and leaning on it and utilizing it in the day-to-day progress of our spiritual maturity, then really, are we giving it any attention? If your wife asks you to repair the cabinet door that keeps falling off, And you hear her say, I need this cabinet door repaired so it keeps falling, so it doesn't fall off anymore. Are you really paying attention to her words if you don't actually do it? What are you going to say? Yeah, I heard you. That's what we say, isn't it? Oh, I heard you. And then she will reply later, a few days later, did you hear me when I said I really need this counter, this this, uh, cabinet door repaired? Yeah, I heard you. How do we really know that we're paying attention if not to employ it? I want you to see this 
Second thing, first was the warning, second is the challenge. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard. We must. It's in the imperative mood. It's got to happen. He, he's saying there's not even an option as believers that, that if we really are serious about this thing called our race of faith, if Jesus really is the Lord of our life, then we must pay closer attention to the things that we heard lest we let them drift away, lest we let them slip. I want you to see that some of you may say this morning, well, Pastor... The writer of Hebrews is writing so early in Christian history that they didn't even have a pocket New Testament, right? They didn't have these fancy Bibles that we have, both Old and New Testament, cross-references, dictionary, thesaurus, concordance, words of Christ in red. They didn't have that, and you'd be absolutely right. And you may be tempted this morning to say this. You may say, Pastor, he's telling them that they should pay closer attention to the things that they heard because hearing was all they had. Because the words of Jesus Christ as told to his disciples are then passed out through his disciples to others. So it was verbal, you would say. So he's just telling them that they need to listen more carefully. You know the crazy thing? You and I are living in a generation, an age, that is unprecedented in the access provided to information. There has never been another generation that has such access at fingertips to information that this generation has. So when we're saying, well, pastor, he's just saying that because all they had to do was listen. Let me ask you a question. Are you and I leveraging these resources we have to grow in a knowledge and in our maturity in Christ? Do you see any one of you has the ability to go to the internet and read this entire text in the original language in which it was written? with study notes and commentaries by men that know more than most. Commentaries are available on the entire Bible. Videos of great Bible teachers and Bible scholars are available to us literally at our fingertips. We can know more than we have ever known. We can be, at this moment, the most equipped, prepared, knowledgeable body of believers, generation of believers that the world has ever seen. Would you agree with that? We have at our disposal the ability to be the most knowledgeable and equipped body of believers that the world has ever seen. Why then are we not taking more advantage Of all of the resources that we have, let me ask you, what do you think God could do with a generation of believers that is informationally equipped? You see, I'm I'm amazed. When you read Bible scholars from 200 years ago that didn't have cross-reference Bibles. When you read... And you study those men that didn't have all these resources that we have. And I look at those guys and I honestly look at them as giants because they had such little light and such little resources and yet they did so much with the little that they had. And yet here we sit in the world of information, all of the spiritual, all of the knowledgeable world of Christ is at our fingertips. When was the last time someone binged watched Francis Chan? Seriously, when was the last time we binged watch a Bible study series? When was the last time we said, do you know it's credible to me that we live in an age where we literally don't have to say, I don't know? When you were a kid and somebody asked you a question and you didn't know, you just had to not know. 
Remember that? Well, don't know. Go to your grandma's house and get the Encyclopedia Britannica and we'll check it out. We'll be there next week. You had to go to bed for seven days not knowing. We live in a day and an age when we don't know. Here's the question. What are you and I doing with all of this light that is afforded to us? Are we filling our brains? Are we paying close attention to the Word of God? Are we reading it as it is? The Word of God, paying close attention, adopting it into our life, employing it in our circumstances, leaning on it for our reliance in the day-to-day moments of life. I hope we are. I wonder that maybe sometimes we feel that we found some other path to spiritual growth apart from the Word of God. And I'm here to tell you, the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to bring about spiritual maturity and growth in the people of God. I want you to see, thirdly, the consequences. What happens to that person that is no longer attentive to the Word, preached, spoken, or heard? What happens to that person as they're drifting further away from the truth? You would think that it would be enough for the writer of Hebrews just to say, hey, because Jesus is who he said he is, we should listen. And in a perfect world, that would work, right? It's like when we tell our kids, no, we're not going to go out and eat after church. That should be enough, right? Because we tell them. Don't you have to have three, four, five, six reasons why? The answer is no. Here's what the writer says. Verse 2, chapter 2, verse 2, For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? You know what he's saying is he's going back and drawing from the Old Testament. He's saying that Mosaic law that they had that was divinely delivered Each act of disobedience, each act of transgression, stepping over the line, each act brought with it just retribution. You see, I think sometimes we might be spiritually anesthetized as we're drifting, not giving much thought to the consequences of our drift and the danger of not thinking much of the Word of God. And I would imagine that you and I, probably each one of us at some part in our life bears the scars of those drifting away from the Word of God. Scars that cut us as an act of discipline and the danger that we got into as a result of letting the truth slip. The negligent, drifting hearer progresses further and further away. I want you to see chapter 3 for a moment. Take your Bibles and just flip over there for just a moment. Running back into the Old Testament that they were so familiar with, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, speaking that Jesus is greater than Moses. Chapter 3, starting in verse 7, he speaks about the generation that was not allowed to go into the promised land. That generation that did not believe the promise of God. Look at chapter 3, verse 8. I want to hit the shotgun style for you. Chapter 3, verse 8. This is a person who has neglected or has cast aside the word of God. Listen to this progression. Verse 8. Do not harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion. These people who are not growing have cast the word aside or not giving attention to it. As he is saying, you must give much more attention to it lest you let it drift away. You should not neglect the word of God. Why? Because part of this progression is that eventually your hearts will harden. And he uses the reference of the Old Testament, the the generation at Kadesh Barnea in Numbers chapter 13. He uses that story to awaken the believers 
to say they were not allowed to go into the promised land. They were not allowed to experience the fullness of the promises of God for that generation because their hearts became hardened. How did they become hardened? Because they had drifted away from the truth. Look at verse 10. Therefore, God says, I was provoked with that generation and said they always go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. These people did not just have hardened hearts. They would go astray. Look in verse 12. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Evil, unbelieving heart. Verse 13, but exhort one another every day as long as it is, is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. <coughs> Verse 16, 15. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, <clears throat> as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt, led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell? And whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Let me recap. Drifting away. Subtly, gradually, away from the word of God. Can lead to hardness of hearts can lead us to go astray, can lead us to an evil, unbelieving heart that wants to fall away from the living God, can lead us to the hardness of heart from the deceitfulness of sins, can lead to rebellion. We can become a person who has provoked God to the point of sin and we have fallen under his hand of discipline and judgment. Verse 18, disobedient. Verse 19, unbelief. I'm afraid that there may be in our life a temptation to believe a very particular lie of the enemy. You see, as children of God, we know his grace and mercy abounds. We know that where sin did abound, grace abounded much more. But I'm afraid also as children of God that we may mistake God's patience in our sin for his permission of our sin. I'm afraid that we may think sometimes that because God has not chastened or disciplined me in my drifting, in my lack of concern for the Word of God, in my spiritual immaturity, I'm afraid to think that we think because God has not disciplined or chastened us as children in our drifting away that it, somehow we may twist our minds around to believe that he is somehow okay with it. To distort God's long-suffering and patience over our rebellion or drifting is to attack the very character and nature of a holy and loving God. What we are saying, now don't mistake me, we would never say this out loud. This is something that only resides in the deep recesses of our heart. God, if you have not disciplined me yet, then you must be okay with it. In Psalm 50, Asaph wrote to God's people, and in a song of praise, sang in the temple. He addressed the unrighteous people that were around him. And one of the claims that he made as a representative of God, of the unrighteous people in his midst, he said that God said, you thought I was altogether like you. What God said was a claim of those people was that they thought God was just like them. 
He is not like us. He is greater than us. He always disciplines those in whom He loves. Many of us bear the scars and, and painful memories of the discipline that was painful yet necessary for our life. And I ask you this. Are we drifting away from the Word of God? Are we holding on to it? Are we maintaining and growing and learning, studying on our own, utilizing the resources that are around us, memorizing, meditating on the Scriptures, the very Word of God to bring us to a place of spiritual maturity? Or are we like these recipients of this letter, stalled out, just drifting, just floating? Because if we are floating, God loves us too much to allow us to continue to drift like that. It's not a question of will we be disciplined. It's a question of when and how. God's love is confirmed and that he always disciplines his children. Today, in light of God's word, where do we stand? Have we cast aside the word of God? Are we walking in outright rebellion? Did one of those eight definitions in chapter 3, did one of those really fit where you are right now? Are you out of fellowship with God? Are you just trying to live off of all the stories and Bible verses you once knew, not continuing to grow in the knowledge of the Word of God? Are we living up to the tremendous amount of light and resources available to us? For the glory of God. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Friends, the Word of God reminds us we have a great salvation awaiting us through the work of Jesus Christ. And if you've never been saved, if you've never started that relationship, I'm going to invite you to do that today. From your heart to God's heart, right where you are, you have the ability to say, God, I know I'm a sinner. And that sin has separated me from you. But your son Jesus Christ came to the earth. Lived the perfect life that I was unable to live and died on the cross for my sins. He was buried and three days later he came back to life. To prove that that sacrifice was accepted. And everything he said was true. And today... I put my entire weight on the promise of eternal life through Jesus Christ. I receive by faith that free gift of salvation. Friend, if you made that decision this morning, I want to invite you to come up and speak to our counselors. Let our church family know. We want to rejoice with the angels of God in heaven that rejoice over one sinner that repents. Today, maybe it's not just about salvation. Maybe for some of us, it's a rededication. Say, God, I've been drifting. And I don't want to drift anymore. I'm taking control. I'm yielding control of my life to you. And I want to be swimming back upstream. God, give me a hunger and a thirst for your word to grow in a knowledge of who you are. Maybe it's church membership. Maybe it's baptism. Whatever decision you have to make this morning, I pray you would make it to the glory of God. Hey, thanks so much for listening to our podcast at First Baptist Joplin. If you are interested in coming and worshiping with us live, we would love for you to come at 9 and 1030 on Sunday mornings.